The following program is a Town of Colony television production of the William K. Sanford Town Library. Welcome to Albany County News. I'm Mary Rosak, the Director of Communications for Albany County. And we are going to talk today about domestic violence, crime, any and all services that are available to folks who find themselves on the other end of, of a crime, those who need help, those who are uh, survivors, those who are fighting back, and those who are looking to, uh, to regain something that they may have lost or something that was taken from them uh, during an act of violence. And to talk about that with me today is the Albany County Director of the Crime Victim and Sexual Violence Center, Karen Ziegler. Karen, Thank you, welcome. Mary. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm glad that, that you're here, and I'm glad that we are, we are talking the first time since uh, the pandemic yes. uh, hit. And things changed dramatically for, for all of us. And I know that things um, things changed uh, a, a bit for crime victims, and the people that were actually reaching out mm -hmm. were not reaching out. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Crime Victim and Sexual Violence Center was always open. We never closed. We, even though we were remote, we were able to very quickly pivot with a lot of support, so that we were able to offer remote therapy. We offer remote. We continue to offer remote uh, court advocacy. We, our hotline is still up. We were doing um, ER accompaniments using um, the virtual world and, and the support from the SANE nurses uh, to do that. So we never closed. We were always open and always serving victims. How challenging is it, or was it, mm -hmm. when everything vir is, is virtual? It's very, it's very different. It's, as, a, as, as a clinician myself, um, it, there's nothing like being in the room with someone, just being able mm -hmm. to, to see them, to connect with them. Um, it's very different. So in terms of therapy, we're very lucky to have a, a number of platforms that we use that are safe and confidential, completely private, so that we, we can continue working with our victims and we like to see them. So phone sessions aren't as effective as uh, screen sessions, mm -hmm. but still, we don't necessarily know who's in the room with our victim, right. um, which is a concern. There was a, a video that came out with, it was a uh, court session, and it was a domestic violence victim, and the judge very acutely saw that, or believed that the, the, the um, offender was in the room, and they were. And she violated the person as they spoke and, and, and sent deputies to pick him up. So we can't guarantee the safety of our victims as much when they're remote. Mm -hmm. But I will say that a lot of our victims appreciate the remote option. It's much easier than having to leave their house, drive, drive, find a parking spot, get to us, and then get back. So what maybe it halves the time it normally would for someone to have a session. So mm -hmm. while it's not it doesn't, it doesn't have the same uh, connection that in-person does. It offers more in terms of accessibility and ease of, of contact. So so there's sure. that piece. Sure. Let, let me ask mm -hmm. you, in the example that you just gave, mm -hmm. um, how scary is that, though, to know that the offender is there, yeah. the judge is there sending people there? I mean, you don't know what's going to happen in that time frame because if yeah. someone is mm -hmm. already accused mm -hmm. of domestic violence, you've got to believe that maybe that violent behavior could be executed on this person Absolutely. Well, before exactly. someone gets there. Exactly. It, it's terrifying. We, we our, ourselves recently had a situation, and it, it wasn't um, the person's... We believe the person who, who is engaged in, in, a, in an abusive relationship, and although they themselves don't identify it as such, the, be, the behaviors are, are very concerning to us. And while we were having sessions, we would say to the person, it sounds like you know, you are, you're monitoring your answers, you're, you're being very careful in what you say. Is there anyone else in the room with you? And, and they kept denying it, but I have, but I, we do believe the, the person that we are concerned about was in the room with them at the time, and monitoring their responses to us. So we, we so even we've had that concern. It wasn't to the level of that, that judge in that court case, but mm -hmm. yes, I think it's just an ongoing issue. How, so the, the fact that that, that also um, stifles, mm -hmm. not only what people can say, yes. but when you are in a pandemic situation, mm -hmm. you're in your home, you're yeah. not going anywhere, right. you're with your abuser, mm -hmm. Uh, or your alleged abuser, I suppose I, I should say in this instance, um, 
you really can't in many instances get the help you need or even reach out or research mm -hmm. the help you need can we talk a little bit about that too because part of what crime victims does mm -hmm. is make sure that people understand mm -hmm. about internet and computer safety yes. the do's and don'ts and mm -hmm. it's not what people it's not what you out there are thinking it is it's a little bit different mm -hmm. you want to talk about that karen oh absolutely it it a lot of abusers are very savvy, very tech savvy, and it is it is frightening. Mm -hmm. um, most people would never think about certain things, but yeah. So we have the hotline certainly, so someone could call us at any point in time. But we also, over the, with the pandemic, started a chat feature. So mm -hmm. between ten and two every day, someone could text us. So if they go to the, um, the Albany County website and click on our page, there's a big red button. It's our chat feature, and they can reach out to us because sometimes the person might be in the room, but maybe you're playing on your phone. Maybe you could chat with us. Maybe you could text us where you can't make a phone call. We can have a dialogue that way. There are a number of resources for domestic violence victims that have an escape. So if someone comes near you, you hit a button and then you're taken to a very different screen and um, someone would not necessarily know what you were doing. We'll talk about clearing your browser history because you don't want to have anything that's going to link you to any of the resources that your, your batter could take your phone and scroll through. So that is absolutely a concern. We offer a lot of information and trainings around that. Mm -hmm. um, people can put apps on your phone. If they have your password, they have all kinds of access to your phone. So they can put apps on your phone and track you. Mm -hmm. They can put apps on your phone and turn on your microphone and your camera without your knowledge and watch you and listen to you as you go about your day. So if you're, you're confused, well, how does someone always know where I am? You might want to look at your phone and, and the apps don't necessarily look like what they are. They could be very discreet. It could be some random app, but it could actually be a tracking app. Mm -hmm. um, and we can certainly offer resources and your local police department can offer resources if you have any concerns about your phone being used against you. Mm -hmm. And I know, you know, thinking about the computer, mm -hmm. if someone was, is in a situation and they want to find resources, you don't often think about the fact that, you know, your browsing history is up there. If yes. you're making a plan, if you're doing mm -hmm. research and planning an escape, yes. you're, you know, that that's... It's scary to think about that. It is absolutely scary. And that's one of the things we took into account when we were helping people safety plan during the pandemic. Um, the shelters were open, but a lot of people were very hesitant to go to shelters, understandably mm -hmm. so. So we had to take into, into account that people weren't, net, weren't going to leave for the most part. What could they do instead? And sometimes we found that the batterers were moving back in with mm -hmm. the victims because they lost their housing. So if there's children in common or for other factors, the victim may not have felt they had a choice but to allow the batterer back in. And that just added a whole layer, layer of instability and uncertainty for them. Now, there are two different things when we talk about the pandemic. On the one hand, we've heard, well, domestic violence was up mm -hmm. during the pandemic. On the other hand, our numbers may not necessarily show that yes. because people were afraid to reach out because their abuser is with mm -hmm. them. What, What is actually the truth here in Albany County? Which, which one is it? I do think the numbers have gone up, and I, again, I wouldn't limit it to domestic violence. I would say mm -hmm. sexual assaults went up, child abuse went up, and elder abuse went up. All, yeah. Everything went up. People, uh, if you, it's a perfect uh, storm. So um, poten potentially if there were financial issues, there were financial stressors, people may have lost their jobs or were underemployed if they lost a part-time job or had to go down to part-time. So you had financial stressors, you had people who were trapped in their homes, people who were afraid, um, people with, with maybe limited information or understanding of information. So all the factors that came together that are just going to kind of feed any violence that may have been in the relationship or just simmered below the relationship. Mm -hmm. um, you had people like children for, weren't going out of the house, so they weren't going to school. They weren't um, seeing anyone who could identify that there was abuse going on. Same with um, our, our older population. Mm -hmm. where they were very vulnerable to the COVID vaccine, uh, to the COVID virus, and they may have been in their homes and potentially abused by a caretaker or a partner or a family member and had no recourse. They had no way to get out. Mm -hmm. Sexual assault, the same thing. Most sexual assault victims know their, their perpetrator. So if you had somebody, maybe you were, you were staying with a friend or a friend was staying with you and, and then there's... Um, you were assaulted, what what were you going to do? If you didn't have any, if you lost your job, you lost, you, you couldn't pay rent, maybe, you know, I know that landlords were not supposed to evict, but people could still have found themselves homeless, and this is the person that is offering you a home, 
and they're taking uh, sexual assault as part of, of your payment. So um, I think every every category of crime victim, I think, went up. We saw violence in the streets. We saw shootings go up. There were stabbings. Um, there were ba there was battery. I think a lot of things went up because of I think the tension and the fear. And I don't think we react well to those things as as as, a, as people. As we started coming out of the pandemic, did you see an increase, though, in any particular area where now as things were opening up, there was more uh, a feeling of now I can go and, mm -hmm. and, and talk freely? Was mm -hmm. there any particular, was it, you know, the, the elderly? Was it with sexual assault victims? Was, I mean, was there any one particular group that seemed to open up faster, that seemed to come, you know, feel, feel more liberated to do that? I'm going to say um, most most of our elder abuse victims are very reluctant okay. for a lot of reasons to speak. They're they're afraid of losing their independence. Or a lot of the time, their abuser is a family member, or maybe a child or their partner, and, and they don't want that person to get into trouble. So they are actually one of the least likely to be vocal and and, mm -hmm. and to minimize and and not necessarily acknowledge the, the violence. I think when kids started to get out and started to be seen again, we've had, again, a huge increase in child cases. Mm -hmm. um, we've had an increase in both sexual violence and domestic violence, but I can tell you our core advocates are incredibly busy. The courts fell behind because right. of that, so the backlog has been incredible. So I think just across the board, things have, have really picked up. Our staff are incredibly busy. So I don't think people realize, like you said, that the courts got incredibly backed up. What is it like now in going going to court, being able mm -hmm. to go in person, is it still a combination of, of virtual and in person? It, it's both. Uh, we, most of the courts are still virtual. A few of the courts have opened up. Um, for example, I'll say Cohoes. Um, there's there's mask wearing. There's social distancing. Um, but for example, we're not allowed back in Albany Police Court, which is our busiest busiest court, mm -hmm. because there's a limited number of people that are allowed in the court at one time. And if a, one of our caseworkers were there, that'd be one less defendant that could be there. So again, further bogging down the system. Sure. So we're we're still being remote as much as possible, and sometimes it's for safety, but sometimes it's just mostly to make sure that the courts can go as quickly as possible, so that um, defendants can have their case go to trial as they deserve, and victims can get justice as they deserve. So how difficult then is in that situation? Is it to to show that support when you can't physically be be there? Yes. To whether it's you know hold a hand, maybe not hold a hand mm -hmm. in some instances, mm -hmm. um, but 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 physically be there to show that support. How difficult is that? It's it's been a challenge. Um, I, I think that again most of our court contacts have been over the phone for as opposed to our clinical contacts, which have been um, using other platforms. So. It is much harder to do um, the work that we do, but I think we've had a lot more contacts, so it, we've been having more frequent calls, more frequent follow-ups, so that people are still reaching out for help, and, and it's, I think they're just looking for more reassurance. Mm -hmm. And, and, that's, and that's, very, that's great, because that's what we're here for. There are all kinds of, of programs that, um, I guess we would say we're, we're maybe put on the back burner, mm -hmm. so very important programs, mm -hmm. but with things closed down, right. Couldn't, you couldn't really do that. I want to right. talk about some of those um, some of those programs now that that have uh, come to the forefront that have reemerged. Uh, I am talking with Karen Ziegler, the director of the Albany County Crime Victim and Sexual Violence Center. Uh, let's start out first with Safer Bars. Yes. And Safer Bars, um, you know, people may not know what the whole program mm -hmm. is about, but it's really it's it's really one where you're protecting yourself and looking out for others at the same time. Yes. Yes. It's about people. We want people to go out and enjoy a nightlife experience without worrying about being violated, without being assaulted, mm -hmm. without being hurt. So we train bar staff um, and the bartenders and, and anyone associated with the bar on how to recognize aggressive, sexually aggressive behavior and, and what to do if they observe it. Um, so yes, when the bar shut down and there was just takeout, it, it challenged the bars, it challenged us. So we found ways to support those bars that were involved with our Safer Bar program through our social media platforms. Um, and they, the bars have been wonderful. We're looking to start to gear up again and hopefully even expand expand the number of bars, but we did our, we did a social media campaign using mm -hmm. CDTA, we used Brew Life through, um, we had Albany.com, which is a wonderful resource for the community, um, and we updated our brochure. We took pictures of our local establishments to make our brochure even more exciting and more accessible mm -hmm. to our, to our, um, our community. So the Safer Bars, 
absolutely has taken a hit, but we'd love to find a way to work with them and, and get them back up and running because it requires a certain amount, a percentage of the bar staff to be trained. Um, and they had to let some folks go, and, and it was just devastating for everybody mm -hmm. all around. Mm -hmm. We would love to find a way to encourage more bars to become involved with us because we think that, again, we're not looking to blame or hold anybody um, responsible except the perpetrator. But what we'd love to do is help people know when they go to a safer bar that their experience can be one where they can enjoy themselves and, and being with their friends and not have to worry about being a, um, assaulted or, or just having anybody um, harass them in, in, in any way that would make them uncomfortable. You don't have to go through the entire program, but g let's give people some idea of what we really mean by the training mm -hmm. that someone would go through to identify and make and make someone safer so that it is a safer bar. What would some of that involve? We actually have bar cards printed up that are available to the staff. So what we talk about observing. Just kind of pay, the first thing is just to pay attention. So are we seeing someone plying someone with drinks? Um, ordering um, double shots and without the person's knowledge? So again, without consent? And then what staff can do or say just to check in with the person? And we we also offer engaged bystander training for just the community mm -hmm. in general because if you're out with a group of friends and you see a friend it might be a little more uncomfortable with a stranger, but let's say a friend of yours is, is with someone that they've just met and all of a sudden they seem to be slurring their words and maybe falling off the bar stool or just seeming like they're uncoordinated. Just walking up to the person and saying, are you okay? Just getting them aside and saying, are you okay? Is, is this what you want to be doing? Maybe as they walk to, the, to um, a rest room, um, just catching them and saying, is everything okay with you? So it, it's paying attention. It's asking if the person's okay. It's maybe distracting the person that you are concerned about with, you know, hey, I think that I saw somebody out there, you know, keying your car or your car's mm -hmm. getting towed or just something to kind of get their attention away from, from your friend or, or the victim so that, again, you can intercede. Some people might be fine, mm -hmm. but it might give that person just a second to pause to say, you know what, I don't feel good. I don't feel okay. This isn't, this doesn't seem right. And then you can help that person get to a place of safety. Yeah. It, that all sounds wonderful. I know that there are probably some people out out there saying to some of it though you know you ask someone who's had a few too many drinks mm -hmm. if they're okay and this is what they want to do and they may not even know that they may say yeah I'm fine mm -hmm. I mean at what at what point is there are there other like is there anything else you, you might suggest to just the average person you might so even if the person says they're fine maybe you stand there maybe you don't go back to your table maybe you get involved in the interaction and again sometimes it's enough for the perpetrator to know that somebody is paying attention mm -hmm. that can maybe deter them from from the next step, if they say, "Well, you know, I was just going to take them home." Hey, I'd love a ride too. I'll go back to their place with them. I, I don't mind crashing on their couch, and that might just be enough. Mm -hmm. One knows that there's been a great reception mm -hmm. um, by bar owners. They mm -hmm. have they have thought this is a wonderful idea, and some some might say, "Well, geez, you know, that's nice if they think it's a great idea, but I wouldn't have expected that because they probably would have said, as many people might mm -hmm. still think, you go to a bar." Your behavior, mm -hmm. it's on you. Mm -hmm. Did it surprise you that there was the, the positive um, reception from, from bar owners? A little bit, but, but actually we could, that quickly dissipated because we've had such wonderful response. We have amazing mm -hmm. partners, and they've actually helped us reach out to other bar owners so that we can expand our program. Um, everyone wants a safe night out. The bars mm -hmm. want their patrons to know that if you come here, you can enjoy a safe night out with it by yourself or with friends, with a, with a date. It just really lends to the whole healthy nightlife community that we really want to promote in Albany County. And we are not the only county that we, we, we partnered with yes. with others. So this is a movement that's going on across, or has been going on across the state. Absolutely, Department of Health has. We have six regions, all the way from Long Island, all the way over to Buffalo. Um, we in, we're in Region Four, and it's Albany County, Schenectady County, and Oneida County, and we're all doing amazing work with our with the bars and our and Oneida County is working actually with schools because that's another option. Um, mm -hmm. And it, we're just really excited about the idea of working with the community to change, to just really change the values and the, and the norms of our community so that we don't accept violence and we don't tolerate violence for anybody. Sure. Talking about working with schools, you have worked with schools for, for quite some time now, for many years now that I've been with the county for so long, um, on uh, bullying prevention. Mm -hmm. So, you know, schools essentially shut down mm -hmm. uh, in person, right? A lot of them uh, remote. What did that do? to bullying prevention. We really went on hold with that. Um, some, we were able to actually start 
this spring with, with some schools reached out to us and we were able to do some virtual work with the schools. Mm -hmm. We look at violence as a continuum and you have certainly homicide and just before that you have sexual violence and domestic violence but way at the beginning you have bullying. And we believe that if you address bullying and those types of behaviors very early, we may never ever develop into those other types of violent behavior. So if we talk about being a good friend and, and talking about your feelings and sharing and empathy and, and compassion, we believe that those wonderful positive traits in children will develop into wonderful positive traits in teens and adults so that we're not going to, we won't see the violence. The violence won't be acceptable from very early on. Um, so the bullying work in, in the schools kind of came to a halt, but we expanded, actually we were kind of pivoting, so we have our Athletes or Children First uh, campaign that we're working with. So it, when things started to open up, so there are, you know, certainly gymnastics clubs, it, which is where this started, but karate dojos, dance studios, um, lacrosse clubs, our, rec our recreation department. We've been working very different. closely with our recreation and, um, department, so summer camps, anyone, we're very, very excited to work with the staff because we feel we need to train the staff not the children. The children can't protect themselves. Um, they, they, they do all they can to protect themselves from other children, but if we're talking about adult perpetrators... Yeah, um, and let's talk about yes. what, what the ath athletes or children first really means. You're talking about protecting, as you said, from adult perpetrators. Yes. From going, okay. This came from the, the gymnastics um, scandal with Larry Nassar. Um, so it, it started with that. So we have adults. So these could be certainly doctors, but they could be coaches. They could be assistants. Any adult um, who has unfettered contact, unmonitored contact with the child, um, potentially could be an abuser. And I don't want everyone to say, start looking around, oh my God, oh my God, and everyone. But there are behaviors that are, that are concerning. So we call that grooming behaviors. Mm -hmm. It, it trains people to identify behaviors that are off. So there's a lot of wonderful behaviors. A lot of people love kids and just want to be with them and support them and nurture them. But then there are those who prey on children. And that's that small subset of behaviors is what we want to touch on. So grooming behaviors, um, getting the child aside, um, making them feel special by ex isolating them from peers and from others, uh, maybe plying them with alcohol or drugs, introducing them to pornography, touching them inappropriately. Um, there's, there's so many behaviors that we can, and for anyone who's interested, we would talk to about, so that we would identify that. So if, a, if one adult, if the coach sees a parent, or if a parent sees a coach, and, and the, the touching is a little more than you might as expect. Um, perhaps it's it's not always at the shoulder, maybe it's upper upper thigh. There's just mm -hmm. places where children should be touched by by a stranger, or even a non parent. Um, so those types of behaviors we want to alert adults to look at and to protect their children. Because if you have a, an eighty pound child and a two hundred pound adult that child has been taught to listen, taught to be obedient, the, the size difference, um, they're, they're not going to be able to say no in a way that's meaningful. Um, and again, adults ply children with, with attention, with affection, with gifts, with all kinds of things and makes that child feel special and encourage that special secret relationship that's very confusing for a child. They don't necessarily know that this isn't okay, that this is wrong. Um, there's a lot of tactics that, that go behind the grooming that, again, we could certainly go more into detail, but we were really, really listening to teach coaches and parents, if they're interested, on what to look out for and what to do if they observe it. So when you actually have the, these camps, et cetera, mm -hmm. what, is it, what is it like? Is it uh, like a one-day program or a, one, a session where you would go out and, and meet with the coaches, meet with all of them, uh, and, and, and take them through a training? It's actually it's, it's a very specific training, um, and I will, I will let me own that I am not completely confident to answer that question. Sure. Um, Lori Walker is our community education coordinator and she mm -hmm. manages all of it. So uh, I know that there is a very prescribed program um, that sure. we can do for people. 
it, we would look to accommodate. So, I mean, there's a certain amount of training, but if someone wanted it in two, two half sessions as opposed to mm -hmm. one long session, we could certainly accommodate that. Got it. Got it. Not, not a problem. So is it, it's completely geared towards the adult, or is there a component for the children? There is a component for the, for the youth as well. And in fact, we have a lot of different kinds of programs that we could, that we, um, could address. So we have programs that are very, that are gendered, some that are co-ed. Uh, but yeah, so we, we want to, of course, educate the coaches and make them the ones with the primary responsibility. But we also want to talk to, to, the, to the youth. Um, if, if you do feel uncomfortable, what could you do? And, and what kinds of things may make you feel uncomfortable? Just talking about things that they might, again, sometimes it's something that's happening to them, but sometimes it might be something that's happening to their peer. And again, seeing something, one of the most effective ways is to go to a parent or a trusted adult to say, hey, something kind of weird happened today during practice. Something odd today happened on the bus. And, and making an adult or, or again a trusted um, adult know what happened and let them take the, the next steps, which is maybe a child can't or youth can't take, but that adult could. It's got to be very difficult um, when when you hear these stories, when you take these phone calls, when you're on the on the chat line, uh, you know, doing this. What are the, some of the coping mechanisms or some of the support for those who work uh, for the Crime Victim and Sexual Violence Center? Well, we're very lucky to work for Albany County, and I have to say it because there's um, a very, um, we have amazing support from the county executive and from the legislature, so we have, um, our staff use their accruals. We really build in self-health, self-care time and mental health time, so we, we do a lot of activities on our team. Um, so our, our large staff does activities, and the smaller teams do a lot of self-care as well. Um, I really am ex so honored to work with such a fantastic team of people who look out for themselves and for others. So we pick up for people. Um, if people need a day, we, we will um, actually pitch in and make sure that, that all of our, our responsibilities get taken care of, all of our victims, are, their needs are met. But maybe a person needed to step away for a day to take some time for themselves. We do a lot of all the work that we do to help our victims in self-care kits, we do for ourselves as well. So that we do a lot of just kind of sometimes fun and silly things. And some Sometimes it's just, if you need a day, take a day. Take it before you're burned out. And we're very well aware that this is tough work, that sure. this is hard work. And um, it's it's a, an honor to do it, but it's also difficult. So we try to balance those two things. There are volunteer opportunities. Can you just talk very briefly about, about if someone were interested in volunteering, what, what that might entail? Absolutely. Right now, the, we're not looking for any court volunteers because the courts are shut down, but our hotline is always looking for volunteers. We have trainings every couple of months, and we are, right now, we're completely virtual. And even when we're in person, there's a great deal of our training that is done uh, online, so that it's done at your convenience. And then we have some in-person sessions that are skilled practice um, and in group role play sessions so that we can answer questions and, and really build those skills that people need to answer phone calls or go to an emergency room to help someone who's just been, um, just been hurt. So when we go to the ER, it's certainly it's sexual assault, it's domestic violence, it's child abuse, it's physical abuse. So we really, elder abuse, we, if, anyone, if someone's been hurt in Albany County, um, we will go to the emergency room and we, we can accompany them and help them through the process. So there's a little bit of something for everyone in terms of if they want to volunteer, yes. there's a way to, to do that. Absolutely. Karen, thank you very much for, uh, for joining uh, me today. Uh, this has been uh, an edition of Albany County News where we were talking about the Crime Victim and Sexual Violence Center, the programs that are offered uh, in Albany County with Director Karen Ziegler. I'm Mary Rosak, the Director of Communications. We'll see you again soon.